Hello, everyone, and welcome to the July session of the Seekers Forum. I hope you're having an excellent weekend. For those of you in the Northern Hemisphere, I hope that summer is going well. And for our friends who are watching the replay of this uh, tomorrow in the Southern Hemisphere, I hope that winter is treating you beautifully as well. And let us say hello to Jay. Jay Copley, how are you? Hey, good to see you, Mark. Good to be here. Good to see you as well. So, folks, tonight we're going to be looking at the inner life of aging and the obsession with youth in our culture. This is a huge topic for many of us in the Seekers Forum who are confronting this on a daily basis. We know that aging impacts every area of our life, our social life, our professional life, our interpersonal life, our medical life, our intellectual life our sexual life, as well as our existential life. As boomers who are reaching retirement with our life expectation extended tremendously, we find ourselves in the wave of the largest number of senior citizens in the history of our species. Simultaneously, the prevailing culture's obsession with youth, with staying young, thinking young, acting young, is at an all-time high. So as seniors, or soon-to-be seniors, a lot of folks fear the marginalization that comes with getting older. The feeling of becoming irrelevant or invisible or useless in a culture where aging is seen as a handicap that guarantees us a lower market value. Now, in our youth-focused society, older people are expected to be self-sufficient and if they can't be, they're supposed to acquiesce to getting shut into old age homes or where they won't bother anyone and their care can be taken over by strangers. This is an antithetical attitude, obviously, to traditional cultures where the old are honored and cared for and really part of the fabric of the community. This systemic prejudice results in a great deal of internalized ageism internalized ageism, that's the self-judging, self-hating messages that we turn in on ourselves, which become our nemeses just as much as the adversarial elements in the culture around us. I saw an example of this recently while I was watching the film Nomadland. I don't know if you've seen it, it's a really wonderful film. I was watching it with a group of people who, most of whom were over 70. If you haven't seen Nomadland, it's about a widow who's played by Frances McDormand, who leaves her hometown after her husband dies and the local industry closes down to become a working nomad, a part of a growing population of houseless people, mostly elders, who travel around the country in their vans and their cars and their trailers. It's a gritty, authentic, powerful movie about human resilience. It's a naked look into the growing subculture also of elderly people who fall through the cracks of society and create their own way of life on the road. Some of them choose this life voluntarily and others like McDormand's character are pulled into it by his circumstance and sort of choosing the lesser of two evils. Now, Frances McDormand is great in the role. She's powerful enough to have won the Oscar. And yet, as I sat with this group of seniors watching this extraordinary performance, on the small screen, I was taken back by the comments that were coming from the people around me. I mean, this was a group of educated, uh, progressive, woke feminists, both male and female, whose intellects and hearts I truly respect and trust. It wasn't the performance, it wasn't the amazing characterization, the dialogue, the gorgeous cinematography that impressed them most. Instead, what really blew them away was Frances McDormand's willingness to look so old on screen, to look so haggard and so worn. Her decision as an aging American actress who dared to appear on film as God had made her just left them flabbergasted. One woman said, I can't believe she would do it in a tone of, of sort of mixture of respect and disgust. Another one cheered, good for her, sounding just a bit patronizing. The man who's sitting next to me said, she sure deserved that Oscar, didn't she? These comments continued throughout the film as my companions were weighing in on her strength of character, how brave she was to show herself to the world without filters. And brave is the word that they kept repeating. 
Now, to hear them talk, you'd have thought that Francis McDormand had bungee jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge without a stunt double, as opposed to just not having a facelift. When going out in public without a mask is seen as a sign of enormous courage, you know that you're living in some kind of a police state, a police state of the mind, a police state of the culture, an aesthetic police state. When a woman's willingness to expose her sags and her dewlaps and her worry lines becomes a revolutionary act, you know that you've entered some kind of parallel universe where nature is bad and plastic is good. Now, though aging has never been popular, as in, oh, I'd much rather get old than be glowing with youth, it's really only in recent times, starting in America, that it has become contemptible. Only in an obsessively material culture do we punish ourselves for being subject to the laws of nature. It's a paradox. As materialists, we turn against ourselves as being part of nature, as being made of matter. And we wonder why we feel so unbalanced, so desperate to keep up with people who are decades younger than we are. We try to hide the cost of time. We try to conceal our losses, to remain fresh and dewy to the world around us in order to be loved and accepted and desired. We want to remain part of the tribe, even with our bunions and our pills and our crow's feet. But the thing that made me saddest about the nomad land experience was that this wasn't a bunch of 20-somethings sitting around mocking the appearance of an old lady. This was people older than the actress herself, several of whom have been to the surgeon, who were just awed and appalled by her chutzpah. It made me realize just how intense internalized ageism is today and how deeply it seeped inside our bones. It's really changed how we move through the world, how we see what we expect, what we reject, what we enjoy, and what we imagine that we owe to other people. Now, this is certainly not limited to women, of course. You know, when it comes to plastic surgery, for example, in 2018, 1.3 million of the plastic surgery procedures in the United States were done on men, which was up 29% since 2000. The issue isn't cosmetic procedures, of course. You know, anyone who wants a facelift uh, should have the right to have one and not be judged by others. The issue is plastic surgery as metaphor. Plastic surgery as a sign of our times. It's about the toxic pressure to cling to our youth. It's about the cultural yearning to fight against time, to see age as the enemy to rage against the dying of the light, something I've never understood since the first time I heard that Dylan Thomas line in the poem, rage against the dying of the light. What does that mean? If that's not a setup for failure, uh, I don't know what is. Many people torture themselves trying to turn back the hands of time. In his book, The Travels with Epicurus by Daniel Klein, which is a very good read if you haven't looked at it. He talks about people like this as forever youngsters. They're the sexa, septua, and octogenarians who are jogging and kickboxing and speed dating and popping Viagra and getting hair implants in this compulsive effort to stay young. Years ago, before I was about to do an interview on TV, I was taken into a green room and I sat in a chair in front of a mirror next to Helen Gurley Brown, who used to be the editor and the founder of Cosmopolitan magazine. Now, as you probably know, Helen Gurley Brown was the high priestess of chasing eternal youth. She was almost 90, as skinny as a wraith, chicly dressed, but she had spent her entire career filling the minds of generations of women with the idea that if they weren't staying real thin, if they weren't nipped and tucked and having multiple orgasms several times a week, then they just weren't really alive. Her image was daring and sexy and sassy. In fact, in photographs, Helen Gurley Brown, you know, could have almost been a 60. But sitting there in that green room at 7 a.m. in front of the mirror without her makeup, her eyes sunk in her skull, her hair limp, her shoulders slumped, She just looked tired and small and a little bit pathetic. I really wanted to reach out and take her hand. I wanted to tell Helen Gurley Brown to please relax. 
I wanted to feed her very fattening foods and get her out of the skin tight blouse and remind her that while orgasms are terrific, they are not the road to happiness. To me, Helen Gurley Brown was a poster child for how not to age, what not to believe about your self-worth, how not to arrive at death's door tucked and terrified, and what not to miss about the soul of aging, you know, how it ripens us, how life can become sweeter and deeper and more quiet without losing touch with the outside world of, of vitality and doing and becoming and achieving. Because when we fight against aging, we fight against life. When we hide our wrinkles, we hide our shame. When we chase the promise of staying young, we sacrifice the power of becoming a wise elder. We also sacrifice character. You know, the word character comes from the Greek root for etching. So time etches itself into us. It makes us into the unique creatures that we are. The gifts of aging are character focused. They're inner focused. They have to do with savoring, with reflection, with love, with appreciating the time that we have more fully and with more gratitude than we did when the future seemed to stretch out indefinitely before us. Connie Zweig, who's a Jungian analyst and an author and who's this month's guest interview, talks about this transition from the exterior life to the interior life as shifting from role to soul. She talks about seeing aging as a curriculum, as a course of study with its own learning curve, its own core lessons that everybody faces on the path to becoming an elder. Zweig's specialty has been shadow work, which is ultimately connected to soul and with aging. And that's because aging brings out many of the things that we try to hide throughout our lives, that we put in the shadow. Our fears, our insecurities, our losses, our grief, the telltale signs of death on its way. We are fear of becoming outsiders. You know, that's one of the major fears that comes as we start to get older, being exiled from the land of the living. As we get older and life gets more real, with challenges that we haven't faced before. Emotions that we've tried to keep under wraps uh, really can no longer be hidden. So aging becomes an opportunity for reckoning and becoming who we truly are, for peeling off those layers of shame and regret and denial. It's a time of life for doing emotional repair, for releasing our excessive need for control and for going inward. I can't stress that enough. In traditional cultures, the last third of life is considered the time for going inward, the time for turning away from being a householder and an earner toward the seeker's life. Now, as seekers, when we bring mindfulness to the aging process and we see ourselves as pilgrims on the path of awakening, then getting older can become an extraordinary spiritual practice. It's an opportunity to release the past, to free ourselves from obsolete roles, to develop generosity, to broaden our understanding of our life and our soul's mission, and to reclaim our lost creativity. It's a time of life when we have the chance to return to many of the things that we've either overlooked or made insufficient space for in the process of earning money and perhaps raising a family and being more outward oriented. It's a time to open to beauty. It's a time to play. It's a time to remember the art of leisure and also to appreciate the small things in life. All of these things deepen our character. And deepening character is where authenticity and power and fulfillment actually lie. Now, this is different from becoming stuck in our ways, right? When, we're, when we say we're deepening our character, it doesn't mean we're, we're getting rigid. Because time has an ossifying effect that we need to counter with beginner's mind, with staying fresh and flexible and curious and open. When we do this, we discover a new way of aging, you could say. It's like becoming children again in the biblical sense, open to mystery and surprise and to delight. This quality is actually irresistible and full of joy. 
And that's why a book called When I Am Old, I Shall Wear Purple sold a million copies and is still in print. People need to hear this message. We need to remember that old is still good. As one wise elder put it, the easy path of aging is to become thick-skinned, unbudging, curmudgeonly. To grow soft and sweet is the harder way. Isn't that great? The easy path of aging is to become thick-skinned, unbudging, and curmudgeonly. To grow soft and sweet is the harder way. And that means living more in the present than in the past, which many older folks have trouble doing as life becomes sometimes more sedentary, some people are retired. It's very easy to get lost in rumination of the past. And yet, of course, the first lesson of all spiritual practice is present moment awareness. Present moment awareness by whatever means you come to it, whether it's prayer, meditation, whether it's yoga, whether it's forest bathing, whether it's calligraphy, whether it's sitting on the grass and playing with your grandkids or just staring out the window watching the birds, which is something that David and I do compulsively at home. Immersing yourself in the present is rejuvenating. It, the troublemaking, stressed out, increasingly forgetful brain takes a rest. It brings us here and now in this space, this quiet of the mind and body. And that's where we remember the secret that we have forgotten. And the secret is that we have no age at all because the spirit never ages. The spirit was never born, the spirit never dies. The quiet self behind all the commotion is always present and available to us. And the more time we take to spend in this space, the younger in heart and mind we remain. You know, in interviews with centenarians, folks who have, are 100 or over, you hear the same responses again and again to this question, you know, what's your secret? They say, enjoy the here and now. They say, savor the day, don't seize it. They say, don't waste time on things that don't matter. They say, let go of regret, let go of regret. Stay connected to others, create meaning. Spend time with animals, with children, and time in nature. Connect by whatever way feels natural to you to some kind of a higher power. Respect your body, you know, keep it in balance. Nowhere do you hear these centenarians talk about tightening their abs or ozone therapy or doing workshops on how to live longer. Some do talk about sex alone or with others as being part of their well-being regimen but not a single one I've come across attributes their healthy longevity to how many orgasms they have in a week. They also talk about what old age has to offer, what a relief it is, and not to care so much, not to have to be so worried about the things that we have held so heavily throughout our lives. You know, to think that everything is so important beginning with ourselves. Old age is a time to be able to say no and to ignore nonsense that once bogged you down. To be able to be eccentric, to let go of other people's opinions, to stop competing, and to release this need to get somewhere else, to do more, achieve more, struggle, aspire, because we realize that where we are is just fine. We're not trying to become somebody else. When the great Italian actress Anna Magnani uh, was on a film set and a makeup man tried to cover up her wrinkles, she stopped him and she said, I paid for every one of those lines, leave them where they are. When someone else was asked how she feels about Botox, she said, my face carries all my memories. Why would I erase them? Why indeed? So I would just like to close with a quote from Francis McDormand, who's been asked this same question hundreds and hundreds of times. Why would a working actress like her in an ageist industry where opportunities for actresses over 40 plummet with every decade, why would she choose to reject the, the forever youngster path? And this is what she said. She said, my position has always been that the way people age and the signs that we show of aging is nature's way of tattooing. It's natural scarification. And the life you lead gives you the symbols and the emblems of your life, the roadmap that you followed. Isn't that beautiful? Let me read it again. My position has always been that the way people age and the signs that we show of aging is nature's way of tattooing. It's natural scarification. 
and the life you lead gives you the symbols and the emblems of your life, the roadmap that you've followed. So I would just like to uh, move into our writing now. We're going to be doing a couple of writing exercises this evening, and we won't be doing breakout groups afterward, but then we'll come together and we will have some conversation. So Jay, would you please pull up the first question? I'd like you now, please, to take 15 minutes to write about whether you view your own aging body with reverence, love, and appreciation, or with regret, judgment, and contempt. Okay, do you view your own aging body with reverence, love, and appreciation, or with regret, judgment, and contempt, or something in between? Be as specific as you can be. We'll take 15 minutes to do that, please, and then we'll come back together. 